Hi, this is Miss Worth, and today we're going to learn about plant hormones. Now, what is a hormone? If you took physiology, you probably learned that a hormone is some kind of chemical that is produced in one part of the body and has an effect in one or more other parts of the body. Uh, hormones usually are very effective chemicals, and what I mean by that is that they only need to be present in very small concentrations to have an effect. Um, and since plants don't have a nervous system, hormones are the major way that plant tissues communicate with each other. Now, the first plant hormones were discovered by botanists who were interested in tropisms. And tropisms are movements away from or towards a stimulus. And the three major tropisms seen in plants are phototropism, which is the movement of a plant towards light. Gravitropism is how a plant knows to send the roots down and the stems up and thigmatropism, which is a plant's response to touch. Now, a long time ago, a scientist named Went, and this was in, the, I guess, the late 1800s, wanted to investigate phototropism, which, by the way, was a tropism that Charles Darwin was interested in as well. And what he did, he cut the tip off the tip of a growing shoot, placed it on a porous auger block, and that porous auger block acted like a sponge and sucked out any chemicals that were in the tip of that plant. Then he took that porous auger block and placed it on a plant shoot that had no tip, at which the tip had been cut off. And what he noticed was that there was some kind of chemical in that auger block which stimulated cell growth in the plant and caused the plant to grow. And that was how the first plant hormone, auxin, was discovered. So let's talk about auxin. And if you take a look at the photo in this slide, uh, the plant on the left has been treated with extra auxin, and the plant on the right has been left alone. So what auxin is, auxin is also known as IAA, or indole acetic acid, and there's a number of different forms of auxin, IAA1, IAA2, etc. Auxin is known primarily for stimulating apical dominance, or primary growth. And what that means is that auxin will cause a plant to grow taller before it starts to branch out. And this helps the survival of the plant because the taller a plant is, the more sunlight it can get. Now, the second hormone that was discovered were cytokinins, which is also a family of hormones, also known as zeatin because the first cytokinin was discovered in pea plants, and the genus name for pea plants is zea. Now, in this photograph, the plant on the left is the normal plant, and the plant on the right is the one that's been treated with extra cytokinins. And you'll see both these plants are the same height, but what's the difference? If you take a look at it, the plant on the right has more lateral or side branches. So what cytokinins are known for is stimulating lateral growth. Now, for a plant to be healthy, you need a balance between the auxins and the cytokinins because you want the plant to grow tall enough to get enough sunlight, but you don't want it to grow so tall that it falls over because it's too weak, and you also want it to have enough lateral branches or leaves so that it has enough leaves to capture the sunlight it needs and do enough photosynthesis. So successful plant growth is a balance between these two hormones. Um, another plant hormone are called gibberellins, and this again is another family of plant hormones also known as gibberellic acid, and they are also numbered GA1, GA2, etc. If you look at the photograph on left, it's showing a dwarf strawberry plant in the pot on the left, and then the dwarf strawberry plant on the right has been treated with gibberellic acid. And the gibberellic acid has stimulated stem elongation in that plant. Now, gibberellins also stimulate fruit development. In the picture of the green grapes on the right-hand side, on the left, you'll see normally sized green grapes without any chemical help. And the ones on the right, which probably they look more like the green grapes you see in your grocery store, are nice and plump and fat because they were treated with gibberellic acid during the growth process, and that has stimulated the fruit development. Uh, the next plant hormone we're going to talk about is abscisic acid. And this may sound familiar to you because we talked about abscisic acid when we did the photosynthesis chapter. Abscisic acid controls the potassium ion balance in the guard cells. What does that mean? Well, if there's more potassium ion in the guard cells, more water will rush into those guard cells to dilute out the potassium ion. That will cause the guard cells to bend kind of like if you take a long balloon and blow it up really hard, it'll start to kind of curve a little bit. And that curve in the guard cells will cause the stomata to open. So abscisic acid help control the opening and closing of stomata. 
Abscisic acid is also known as ABA, and it also helps maintain dormancy. Abscisic acid is one of the chemical signals the plant will send out in the fall if it's a deciduous tree that will cause leaf drop in the plant. And dormancy helps the plant conserve its resources until growth uh, conditions improve. Okay, the last hormone we're going to talk about today is ethylene. And ethylene is particularly interested, interesting because it's the only plant hormone you can buy in a can. Yes, a can. Ethylene is a gaseous hormone. And what it controls is fruit ripening. Ethylene is released by ripe fruits. And this is the reason why if you have a bunch of green bananas and you want them to ripen, one of the easiest ways to do it is to put them in a brown paper, ba paper bag with a banana that's already ripe that ripe banana will be releasing ethylene and that will cause the other bananas to ripen. Uh, this is important to farmers because if they have to ship their crops over long distances, one of the things they can do is to pick their bananas when they're not quite ripe yet, so they're harder and less likely to get damaged during the shipping process. Then when the agricultural product, like the bananas, reaches the destination, they can spray it with ethylene and that will speed up the ripening so that by the time they get onto the shelves at your grocery store, they won't be green bananas anymore. Hopefully they'll be nice, ripe yellow bananas. Now, scientists for years have debated whether flowering is controlled by a plant hormone, and there's no clear answer on this. Many botanists think it is, but they've been trying for a couple of decades now to try to isolate a flowering hormone, and they haven't been able to find one. A couple things that they do know influence flowering, however, are circadian rhythms and phytochromes. Now, just like animals have a circadian rhythm, so do some plants, especially when it comes to the flowering response. Now, phytochromes are pigments in the plant, just like chlorophyll is a pigment. Some of the other pigments cause the petals of the flowers to have certain colors. And phytochromes can sense the amount of light in a certain region of the visible spectrum. Um, and somehow that manages to send a signal to the plant to let it know when to flower. And what scientists have found out is that it's actually a critical night length that controls flowering. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, most flowering plants can be classified into one of three categories. Short day plants, long day plants, or day neutral plants. Now, the day neutral plants are unaffected by the photo period. In other words, they're unaffected by the amount of day or daylight or night they get. Tomatoes, rice, dandelions, most weeds are completely unaffected by the length of the day and will flower as long as growth conditions are correct. Now, short day plants would be something like a poinsettia, which would naturally flower during the winter when the days are very short. What, when scientists have found out that actually poinsettias will flower when the days are long if you interrupt their night so that the plants are tricked into thinking the period of continuous darkness is less than 12 hours. And this is really useful to horticulturists who want to sell flowers, say, off-season. Like if you want to sell poinsettias in the middle of the summer, what you can do is you can grow them in a greenhouse where you control the length of light and darkness they get, and just make sure that halfway through the night, you flash a light of the correct wave wavelength, and it turns out light in the red region works the best, and interrupt that night period so the plant thinks it's a, sh a short night, and that plant won't flower yet until it gets a continuous period of darkness of more than 12 hours. So short day plants are kind of a misnomer. They're actually long night plants. Um, conversely, a long day plant, like the Marin iris, actually just needs a short night. So if you were a horticulturist and you had some marine iris plants growing in your greenhouse in the middle of winter, what you would do is flash a bright light in the middle of the night, tricking the plants into thinking that the dark period was less than 12 hours, and that would cause that plant to flower off season. Okay? Now, the pigment that detects the amount of light is called a phytochrome. And there's two different kinds of phytochromes, a PR, which is red absorbing, and PFR, which absorbs far red light. Um, and those two phytochromes can interconvert. When they're zapped with the correct uh, type of photon of light, the electrons move around, and it can interconvert back and forth between PR and PFR. And that is thought to be the chemical that senses the amount of light that helps control flowering. Now, that being said, some botanists are still convinced that there must be some kind of other hormone that is involved in the process. But as I said before, they haven't been able to isolate it yet. So that's what you need to know about plant hormones.